Hello and welcome back to the Fullerton College Print 101 class. This is Professor Ben Hewitt. Today we're taking a look at digital printing, which is chapter 13 in your textbooks. So digital printing, as defined by the textbook, uh, I know you're never supposed to start a speech by defining a word, but uh, this isn't a speech. And uh, in fact, this class does define a lot of words because you're learning a new language when you're learning to print. You're learning the language of print production. So what digital printing means is any reproduction method that uses electronic files, like from a computer, and replicates them using dots. You can be ink, it could be toner, it could be dye for like a dye sublimation type job or any other medium that does this sort of thing. And it's still digital printing. Digital printing is a relatively new, although now it's a fairly, fairly older and stable portion of the print depart, uh, department, sorry guys, print industry, and it's growing in relevance and importance as the technology matures. When I first started printing in my career, uh, digital printing was still not quite where it is today. I mean, obviously, if it's, if it's growing, it was a bit smaller. Uh, when I was the young newcomer to the industry, I found myself working small shops with digital presses and only really getting to use digital, not getting to use what I considered to be, you know, the big kid presses, the grown-up presses, the offsets, the, the big machines. I was always given the computer-based machines, the littler ones. And, you know, I thought at first it was some sort of hazing, but in the end, actually, it was correct uh, to put me there because uh, I was young and getting started and I learned the new technology as it was developing and maturing. And then I found out, or I found out, I kind of continued on in my career and just grew to realize that I was in the right place because digital printing was growing and expanding and I had a very good ground up uh, knowledge of it. And uh, anyways, just saying, sorry, I didn't mean to wax philosophic on you guys there. Uh, but anyways, digital printing uh, was for a while a bit of a joke. Initially, when it first came out, uh, developed by Xerox in the late 70s, early 80s, at least the forms that we know of, uh, with things like xerography, you know, like using a Xerox copier machine, but coming from a computer file, the presses were not that, I mean, they were extremely advanced for their time, but their image quality was not very high compared to what you could produce through other means. Initially, what happened is the digital presses, especially the uh, xerographic types, the uh, electrostatic or toner-based systems, took over the market share that was the small, offset duplicator. Offset duplicators being these small one color offset presses that only printed eight and a half by 11 inch letter size papers for making quick copies of church flyers and school programs for high school band performances and things like that. Cheaply, quickly, actually that's about it, quickly and cheaply. <laughs> really no third, uh, third option there and one color. So early digital printing that was mostly black and white was able to do that sort of thing actually faster and easier. And uh, as we're going to get into, uh, it's extremely good at these types of short runs where you don't need to make millions of copies because digital printing requires very little to no setup. It makes it able to quickly jump online and produce whatever you want made. And you don't have to worry about the setup costs of the plates and the developing and the time and energy and people spent to get it ready to go. So it's actually worth your money to print a single copy when you're running digital because you're not wasting any materials. You're produ you produce it and then you're done. You can take your profit and payment for whatever it costs to print whatever size you just did without having to worry about including the cost of setting it up and the time of developing it and all the extra stuff that it takes to get an offset or flexible pre press running. It's just ready to go. So let's look at some different types of digital printing technologies. Some of the big ones, actually the two biggest ones out there uh, as far as market share are concerned, are inkjet and electrostatic or toner-based. We'll talk in more detail about what both of these are. There's a few other things that do exist out there, uh, including the now vaunted HP Indigo Press, which is C, none of the above, which uses kind of a semi-liquid paste for its ink and uh, is actually in a really strange, it, it deserves its own lecture, so I'm not going to detail it too closely here but actually works using electrostatics like a um, toner-based printer, but is able to produce real halftone dots in really good detail using incredibly good ink and get results that 
quite frankly, don't equal but exceed the results you get off of running um, offset lithography. In fact, the color and the quality of image are so good off the indigo, most companies, when they're telling you how good their digital press is, compare their output quality to offset lithography. The indigo is not compared to offset lithography. It's compared to rotogravure which is to say they're saying that their digital printer can produce stuff on par with beautiful National Geographic magazine prints, which is, by the way, among the best you're going to get. Anyway, so that's a special none of the above technology. But for the most part, digital printing is either going to be inkjet or it's going to be toner based. There's also something called direct imaging. Direct imaging is one of those semi um, missing link type of printing things. I've never seen one in the wild. This is like the Archaeopteryx of printing. For those of you who uh, were ever five years old and remember it, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I'll refresh you. Every five-year-old loves dinosaurs. In fact, my four going on five-year-old daughter just got into dinosaurs because she's dinosaur aged. The Archaeopteryx is this strange fossil they found, which is kind of half dinosaur, half bird. It's a, a famous one. I don't think they found very many of them at all, but it even showed impressions of the feathers in the fossil. Anyways, kind of proving, at least uh, for now, to scientists that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Anyways, so here, here's the Archaeopteryx of printing. It's a digital printer that's also an offset printer. Not in the sense of the HP Indigo, which has its own special technology, but in the sense that inside that giant gray box there, you have a plate maker, a plate processor, a plate mounter, and an offset press, all controlled by a computer. So uh, instead of bypassing the idea of offset printing, it automates the entire thing so that you send to a print file to print from the computer. It makes a plate, processes the plate, cleans the plate, mounts the plate, and prints your job for you. Direct imaging. You may see it in the wild someday. I never have, not in person. So digital workflow. This is different than what you do for other things. A lot of the mechanical, physical, chemical processes necessary for other printing techniques are not present in, present in digital. And that's one of its great advantages. So if you're making something for digital printing, you need to create the text and the image. Someone has to write the copy. Someone has to take the photos or scan them. You have to import the text and the image into the layout, probably in Quark or InDesign. You, and then you more or less stabilize it there and export it as a PDF. And then you impose that, get it all set up in the correct page order and the correct orientations on multiple sides of your paper. And then you send it out to print. Uh, if you're plate making, the DI, direct imaging, will handle it. If not, it'll go straight to your inkjet or um, the electrostatic toner-based system. Should also mention at this time that while the electrostatics and especially the very good ones like the HB Indigos, which are not exactly electrostatic, like I said, those are different. While those all work towards, um, sorry, those are all working towards uh, taking over the offset market share, at least on the shorter runs, there is also some high speed inkjet going on, which can run now uh, web to web, which is starting to compete pretty seriously with flexography. In fact, actually, also, I believe that there are some indigo presses that can run web to web, which are also competing with Flexo for shorter runs. Because again, just like offset, Flexo requires plate making, chemical processing. You have to actually post bake those rubber plates, clean them off really good. Mounting them takes time and trouble and effort. And to be able to run something digitally, which cuts out all that prep time, allows you to print a much smaller run. And printing a much smaller run lets you grab things like small startup businesses which can't afford long runs. So the digital side of packaging is allowing these little companies to have good looking product on shelves at stores and not like the ones I remember growing up which is like a Ziploc baggie, maybe a nice one, but like a little sticker stuck to the front. Now you can get a fully designed, fully printed pouch that looks just as good as if it came from a very major A-list brand. So anyways. Digital workflow is uh, allowing, it's not just taking over market shares and slowly eating up all the printing. What it's doing is creating new market. It's creating new places that other people have never been able to do things before. And so this is an exciting frontier. Every new type of digital technology or new application of it is 
bringing more people to being print customers than previously could have been or would have been because it's taking out that minimum order and making it possible for you to get fewer. That means the people who want to prototype something or do a small test run are able to order professional printing services instead of trying to do it at home and do it badly. So anyways, it's exciting to see this sort of frontier open up. Let's talk ink jets. Ink jets are little tiny streams of ink, liquid ink that spray out onto the paper. There are many names for this. Ink jets, the main one. I should also do my little dig at expensive art prints out there and say, if you've ever heard of gicle, gicle is like French for something along the lines of tiny bubbles. And it literally basically means ink jet. It just sounds fancier. Inkjet is a wide category and it ranges from everything from the really cheap, not so great Walmart specials you can buy and put on your desk next to your computer to print out school reports up through the professional ones that run with special types of ink like UV cured ink that print on anything. They cost anywhere from 30 to $40 up to several hundred thousand dollars depending on what you want them to do. There's an inkjet pretty much at any level of expertise that you're looking for. And with, as with any product, you know, there really is no ceiling on price. You can always find one that costs, costs more. Anyways, so they all use the same basic principles. Uh, there's either, well, yeah, this book doesn't talk about the continuous flowing jets. It only talks about the uh, drop on demand system. Continuous flow is a little different where it's constantly spraying a fountain of ink. And then sometimes it's charged with an electric charge, which causes it to attract to the paper. And other times it's recirculated back through and print and just keeps flowing around and around and around. But most of them nowadays are drop on demand, which means it has a little piezoelectric system and it adds either heat or just electrical charge, which causes the ink to expand and which causes it to force a single droplet out of its tiny nozzle. There's two types of inkjet inks and presses. On the left, the large Mamaki, which I ended up not getting the Mamaki, but I was looking at that at one point for our print lab. I got an EFI instead, just because that's the one that seemed to fit the amount of space we had a little bit better. That's a large industrial, uh, what do you call it? UV cured inkjet over there. And then you can see that it has eight colors of ink into it, which is also an interesting thing. But that is what's called a fixed head. The little, the picture on the right is from the type of Walmart special I have at home, which is just a little desktop printer. Uh, and those are called removable head. So the fixed one means that the print heads, the little nozzles that spray the ink onto the paper or other substrate if you're using UV ink, because I can go on anything, that ink gets sprayed through a hose, through a nozzle onto the paper. And when you want to change things, you, you have to flush out the lines with some solvent and then put a new bottle of ink in where it sucks the ink in and pumps it through. A disposable or removable head, those, are like the, again, the little cartridge ones you have for office and home use, where in fact, the nozzle that sprays the ink is built into the ink cartridge itself. So when you change ink cartridges, you're actually installing new parts in the press. The nozzle itself is disposable. There are advantages and disadvantages to both of these. It's a, a bit of a pain to keep a fixed head printer uh, maintained. Uh, ask me about that sometime, <laughs> how much fun it is to try and make sure that those things keep working. Uh, the large format UV one that we have at our lab at school requires itself to be run every two days or so, or it will clog permanently in its inkjet, in the uh, print heads. That's because the print heads on those, those nozzles have micro pores that were laser etched in a solid piece of brass. And those micro pores are only a thousandth of an inch wide to make those droplets come out. And uh, they clog easily. And to replace one of them is about $6,000 apart. And if you ever use, and there are six of them on the press. So if you ever have big problems, you're looking at $36,000 parts only, plus the intensive labor of replacing and recalibrating all of that. So it's a, it's stressful to keep that going. Dispose, but with those micro pores and those precision made pieces, you get a much higher quality, much better, more consistent control of your droplet size, which means you're able to produce consistent color managed output and that makes clients happy. The disposable ones are better for people at home and in small offices who aren't looking for professional output or quality because the trade-off is easy maintenance, easy fix. If your nozzles are clogged and dead, you simply buy another $20 cartridge, throw away whatever drops of ink you have left and slap in a new one and you're good to go. 
that does get expensive in the short run, but honestly, compared to how much it is to replace really expensive custom-made parts uh, for the fixed heads, it is actually quite economical. I'm going to stop here and we'll come back with another lecture to hopefully finish it out in one or two more videos. Thanks for listening.